Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back. Happy Aloha Friday. And yeah, I'm glad this week is almost over. It's been, yeah, it's been a week. Let's say that. All right, so we're going to finish off with the semester with special senses and finish off the nervous system. I know some other courses, they kind of actually put off the autonomic nervous system and special senses for one for two, but for this course we I try to do give you the whole complete nervous system package in one semester. Alright, and if you're again this is where the preferred book I'm using for this last part of, or this last unit of the semester is the OSU anatomy and physiology which is based on open stacks. You pretty much get the same information just rearranged differently. I think OSU might have a little more detail. So another reason we're going out of sequence because this is one how one it was how the it's how if you have the martini version they actually have special senses after the autonomic nervous system. So this is where we left off and this is where we are now. And I like having special senses toward the end because I think the special senses are really fun. And you're probably familiar with them at to some extent because they teach you about the senses in like elementary school, at least, or at least they did in my when I was a kid. And this is where the OpenStax one again. It's kind of interesting how it's arranged. So in the current edition of OpenStax, they pretty much crack. If you're like, like, wait, where's the special senses chapter? They pretty much took what was formerly a special senses chapter and crammed it in here. So it's in the sensory perception chapter, and again, it's kind of like, this is why I think the OpenStax version is a little janky, and this is why I prefer the OSU version, because they try to make a more coherent narrative. Like, chapter 14 is just, it's interesting in OpenStax. But again, this is why you're probably very familiar with the five senses. So again, the five senses you probably learn as a kid are what you think of your sight, hearing, smell, taste, and then touch. But again, special senses are things that are located to certain tissues or organs of your body. General senses are those that you can feel at multiple sites in your body. So they're not just located to one part. So the five senses that you learned as a kid are probably, yeah, there, four of them are special senses, but somato sensation is, again, a general sense. And it's actually broken down into what we call submodalities or, so basically like, our sense of touch can be broken down into all these things. So things like temperature, pressure, vibration, fine touch, crude touch, pressure. I mean, they're all lead to our overall sense of somatic sensation. So again, sometimes senses can be broken down into small, more, more um, detailed senses. And those are what, when they call, talk about submodalities, that's what they're referring to. Now, special senses, again, four of the five you learned as a kid are special senses, but instead of somatic sensation, now we have equilibrium. So again, we're just changing your five senses, not to say that your entire childhood was a lie, but instead of somatic sensation, now we have balance or equilibrioception. And it's slightly different than proprioception because, or it is different than proprioception. They both lead to your overall sense of position and balance, but not, like a rough way of thinking of it is like balance and equilibrioception in terms of special sense is kind of like head position and acceleration versus body position because you can proprioception of your limbs and your torso and other parts of your body but balance is the part that's in your inner ear. Okay, so pretty much this lecture is going to be devoted mostly to vision because vision very complex and that's why we have optometrists and ophthalmologists and people who make whole livings and careers out of it. Even though there, we have two of these organs in our body, I mean it's very complex, especially with how light just enters your eye and how it's perceived by our brain. Now let's talk about the very general anatomy. So what do we have uh, superior and inferior? Well, we have things called eyelids, but the medical term for that, well, actually, there's two medical terms. So one of the most common medical terms is palpebra. And when you see palpebrae, it's just the plural form of palpebra. So this is a Latin origin of the word. And this part right here is what I call the palpebral fissure. And you might be like, so what is that? Basically, it's the, your eye slit. It's just basically the opening of your eyelids to reveal your eye underneath. Now, you might be like, isn't that pretty obvious? Well, sometimes things happen in nature and development. And there's something called, well, 
um, cryptothalamus or and I'm this link to this syndrome called Fraser syndrome and yeah this is a woman in South Africa I don't know if she actually got the surgery but she was born without eyelids and here's a picture when she was a baby so yeah that palpebral fissure is important so her I think they said like and this people who have the syndrome their eyelids might be actually fused to their eyeball or they might have like no uh, eyelids fissure altogether so she's she's blind she doesn't have any vision but I think she wants cosmetic surgery so she actually has eyelids I didn't see anything I have to look if she actually got the surgery but yeah it shows you once in a sometimes if there's an anatomical structure if something happens during development that can result in abnormal formation of those structures and yeah, so and then what we have here is a layer in the inner part of your eyelids and also surround on on the outer surface of your eye. So these are called conjunctiva. So the bulbar conjunctiva, these are the ones that are the layer, this pink layer that's right along your eye and outer to your eye. And the palpable conjunctiva is right here. So it's on the inner surface. So again, is it closer to the eye or is it closer to the eyelid? If it's closer to the eye, it's the bulbar conjunctiva. If it's closer to the eyelid, it's the palpable conjunctiva. Now, this is conjunctivitis. And ooh, gross, yeah? Like, look at all this, like, probably some bacteria, mucus, white blood cells, and oh, all those tears. And when it, again, whenever you see though that suffix itis, in its proper use, it refers to inflammation of a tissue. So here we have inflammation of the conjunctiva, and what we have is conjunctivitis. Some I know in like common use, sometimes they say like senioritis, like if you're graduating and you're they call the condition senioritis, but that's like uh, in colloquial terms, itis, they're saying itis is a condition, but in the medical term, properly used, itis refers to inflammation. And yeah, that's what we see. I didn't I have to look at or what type of bacteria that was but yeah super super nasty looking and that's conjunctivitis inflammation of the lining of the eyelids or I'm pretty sure it's both bulbar and palpable being inflamed in this example right here now again another thing is that sometimes like I remember that long time ago I told you that you're learning two new languages when you're learning anatomy. You're learning both Greek and Latin or maybe you can and there or you can even see a third uh, two and a half language like medical terminology it's English but it's kind of its own language in itself another term is blepharon and it still refers to the eyelid but palpebra is Latin blepharon is Greek and there's something called blepharoplasty and this is before and after and yeah she probably got more than just eyelid surgery because but let's just focus on the eye so what do we see here well, you might have heard like the colloquial terms or layman's terms like single and double eyelids. And you can tell with her upper eyelids, yeah, she definitely has a change in shape between her upper and uh, upper eyelids, right? So you notice that she has that extra crease. And yeah, this is the most common procedure. And yeah, and especially in Korea, like I guess plastic surgery isn't stigmatized or looked, looked upon, down upon as it is here and in the other countries. Like it's pretty, I, I always remember, I think it was a Vice documentary, but they said like it's a common like six, sweet 16 birthday party or present for parents to give their, pay for their daughter's um, plastic surgery to get double eyelids. And if you look up, like even in Japan, I think they have all, they do have the surgery, but they also have these interesting things where they put like tape in their eyelids to make an like, extra crease. So sometimes they like the extra cosmetic touch due to, I think they say it makes the eyes look bigger or whatnot. But she also has different makeup too, like I think she, but yeah, many things you can make you do to make your eyes look bigger. Yeah, watch the blepharoplasty surgery. Yeah, so if you look at it, yeah, it does kind of open up the eyes a bit. So maybe this is why some people, so this is like, different types and sometimes they actually move this fold right here what's called the epicanthal fold and they kind of actually make it so that this little crease goes all the way instead of this fold of skin over here but yeah this is why it's called blepharoplasty and you might be like why can't don't they call it palpebroplasty I think it's because plasty comes from a Greek root so they try to most of the time match Greek with Greek, Latin, Latin. I know it's like anatomy throw and medica must miss and throws curveballs all the time like that. But sometimes you gotta know both the Greek and the Latin version of a structure. 
And here's Asian and Occidental. Again, this is not accidental. Occidental means Western. But what we have here is that we have the levator aponeurosis. So again, remember aponeurosis, these are connective tissues. And this is like an extension of the tendon of a muscle. Now, what we have here is that with the occidental, with the, someone who has double eyelids, what we see here is that we have this ins insertion over here. Now, over here with the Asian one, what we see is that insertion is more down here. So when this eyelid is retracted in the occidental eyelid or double eyelid, you're going to have a fold here and you're going to have a fold here. But if your insertion is all the way down here, it's just going to retract and you only have one real f or you or one prominent fold. So what they do with the blepharoplasty surgery is that they put in try to in make an additional insertion just like here in the occidental eyelid. And how do they do that? Yeah, what they do is basically put sutures. Yeah, they put this tiny little put these little threads, and they basically use this extend this equal neurosis, and make insert make a new insertion right here. So yeah, they do have to sew things in your eyelids. Now, <laughs> a good plastic surgeon will not sew your eyeball. They just want to do the eyelids. But this is what happens, and this is how they're able to do this from permanent suturing and this double eyelid. Fortunately, thanks mom, uh, if I want double eyelids, I already got that. Thanks to my Filipino mom, but yeah, this is why if you have an Asian, uh, if you want this double eyelid surgery, then in the future, maybe you want to go to Gangnam or whatnot. And it's really cool, like I think I, the, the article they also showed, like there's literally like plastic surgery is like almost like um advertising Starbucks, like plastic surgery offices walk in and you can get your double eyelid surgery during your lunch break or something. It's pretty interesting. I've never been to Korea, but I'll go there just to see like, hey, is this for real? Plastic surgery off the street? Dang. All right. Okay, back to the eye. So we talked about the eyelids. Now let's talk about the eye itself and the gross anatomy. So you probably know what this is, and we talked about this in when we covered the autonomic nervous system. This is your pupil, that black dot in the middle of your eye. But your pupil is not a solid structure, and we'll get to why later. It's actually a hole in the middle of your iris. So the colored part of your eye, most, a lot of people have brown eyes, they even have blue, green, gray. But that colored part in the center of your eye, that's your iris. So this part, and this actually person maybe hazel eyes. They have multiple colors. Pretty cool. But the white of your eye, and it has all these blood vessels as well, but the whitish part compared to the iris is what you call the sclera. So again, the iris is that center, central colored part, but everything around that, that's the sclera and its own layer as well. And let's zoom in on the pupil. And what we have here is again the pupil or in the pupil and the iris. So again, that hole. So you notice that this pupil is a hole in the middle of the iris. So this black part right there, that's the pupil. And surrounding it is that iris. And I know it's very interesting seeing all those like fibers and proteins and structures of the eye iris as well. Now the sclera, this part, the white of your eye is the sclera, and notice that it's very vascular, and all the proteins and all the nutrients that are supplied by that, that also helps contribute to the very, the sclera is a very fibrous, protein-rich area, so this is why it's not opaque, I mean, not, why it's not opaque, why it's not clear, and this is why it looks opaque, so this is why it's whitish and you can't see past it. Now over here, now there's another structure. We talked about the pupil, we talked about the iris, we talked about the sclera. But in this bit part, there's another structure that's there, but you can't really see it. So what we have here is a side view. And what's the part causing the shine over here? So surrounding and outer to your, or not surrounding, but just outer and more anterior to your iris and pupil, you have this layer called the cornea. So notice that the cornea is continuous with the sclera, but what's big? one big difference? The sclera is opaque and whitish, and the cornea should be, in a healthy cornea, is clear. And you want it to be clear because why? You, when you're, for vision, you have light entering your eye, going past the pupils, so you don't want that light being filtered out. You want that cornea to be clear. And notice that the cornea is slightly curved, and this is where we'll get to in very soon. Like, isn't that the curved part is actually very important? 
But again, we're just talking about gross anatomy right now. And here are two angles. Yeah, like back to geometry. These are angles. And which one is me? So this is the right eye we're looking at. So the one that's more inner toward the midline, that's our medial angle. And there's actually multiple terms for this. Medial angle, medial canthus, medial commissure. This is referring to the same structure, just like the inner angle of your eye. And what's the opposite of medial? Lateral, right? So the lateral angle and oh, okay, lateral canthus or lateral commissure. So you have two angles, and again, it just depends. Is it closer toward the inside and your midline, or is it toward the outside and lateral? Now, back to throwback. So again, what is this? Makapia pia, right? So this kind of ice or sleep, eye boogies, whatever you call it. But why does it tend, or which angle does it tend to, which angle is it gathering in this in this picture right here? Medial or lateral? Well, again, lateral is toward the outer way, outer area, and the medial is toward the midline, right? So typically, if you're, I mean, if you have the, you tend to wake up with this. I think everyone's woken up with this. Maybe not to this extent, but notice it's on the medial angle. And it's not coincidental. It's not random whether you woke up. I mean, you might get some here, but typically you get more toward your medial angle. And why is that? Well, the thing is that you also have another structure called here, and it's very hard to see in your own eye because, because, and it's maybe you have, have you have a friend or family member, you can try to look at this fleshy pink part right here. And what we have is what we call the lacrimal caruncle. Do you need to know all the names of the angles? I will probably just call it the angle, but it's more like FYI. So yeah, I just will probably make it simple and say it's the uh, medial and narrow angles. Canthus and commissure, then it's like if you go on to advanced anatomy or medicine, you probably have to know that because, or if you're reading articles on the eye or if you're going to optometry, you probably have to learn all three because if they're somebody's writing something and they use one of the other terms, you should know what it is. Yeah. Yeah, so lacrimal, again, back to when we talked about the skeletal system, lacrimal refers to the tears, right? So anything related to tears is called lacrimal. And we have a bone called the lacrimal bone, and it forms part of the structure, and also with the maxilla, so our, like our upper jaw and nose, part of our face as well, the anterior part. So the lacrimal and maxilla form a big part of this bony structure. But the cool thing is that I like this picture from the old version of the Marti Martini book because why? It basically shows you the flow of tears. This one's a little more abstract, but what you have are these lacrimal glands. So if on each eye, they would be toward lateral and superior, so they'd be up here. So when these glands, these are the ones that produce tears, and when they produce these tears, it flows from here and flows across your eyes, so it goes this way. So this makes sense why you get Makapia Pia, because your tears are washing from outside in. So it's washing this way. So if there's any sort of mucus or gunk or jet dust or debris, it's going to flow this way. So it's kind of like when you see um, leaves gather in a sewage drain. Which way does it? do the leaves gather? It gathers downstream of where the, which way the water flows. And then here we have the lacrimal excretory duct, so all the tears are being excreted this way. And then you have the flow of tears, again, from lateral to medial. And then what we have are these lacrimal puncta. So puncta sounds like punctuation. And think of things like uh, colon, semicolon, or period. They're all little dots. So these are little dots and small little openings that lead to these lacrimal canaliculi. So these small little canals that lead to the lacrimal sac. And through this lacrimal sac, which is surrounded by the lacrimal bone near maxilla, then it goes into the nasal lacrimal duct and then into the nasal cavities. So, extra tears, they get, I mean, if, assuming they don't spill out onto the surface of your face, they're going to wash across your eyes and collect in this lacrimal sac and flow down to your nasal cavity. So, this sounds like a great type sort of an exam question, right? I love these things where it t tells you, like, it's pretty linear and t tells you, okay. Where do our tears produce? How do they wash across your eye? And where do they end up? Now, this is another reason why, if you say you're producing a lot of tears, yeah, it's going to be running down your face. But what also happens if you're having a bout of crying? Well, the thing is that, you know, like, this is how I can tell someone's fake crying versus real crying is that 
if it's like real ugly tears, you're, I mean, you're going to be blowing your nose. This is why you need the tissue because your tear glands are in overdrive. Then you're going to get all this tear production. You're going to be flooding your lacrimal sac and you're going to be flooding your nasal cavity with all these excess tears in addition to the tears over here. So this is why you have that increased secretions from your nasal cavity when you have increased tear production. Now, what are tears itself? Well, we know it's some sort of liquid, or li the medical term is lacrimal fluid. But tears, they're some sort of liquid, right? And they're watery, and they're pro and if you've tasted them, they tasted salty, right? And this is like a, I actually like this brand. I'm not, a, <laughs> no sponsorship here. But it was interesting because when it first came out, and I had to do some searching, they used to use this, ta this sort of like tagline, inspired by the biology of your eyes. And I'm like, and I think it used to say, like, works like your tears. I'm like, mm. well, what are in your tears? Well, the, there are three main components, and there's the aqueous layer. So most of your wa tears are water-based. And why are they salty? Well, what's the chemical formula for table salt? You have sodium chloride and also other electrolytes like potassium as well. So, But that sodium chloride is why it tastes salty. And you also have metabolites as well, but don't worry about memorizing a laundry list of metabolites. I just want you to know that water and things that dissolve in water are a major component of tears. So maybe this, I mean, they don't publish all the exact chemical composition, but it's probably what they try to balance. But there's also mucus. And remember that mucus is, well, why is mucus kind of jelly-like and sticky? It kind of holds on to water so mucus helps to kind of thicken up tears so they're not just complete water you have some mucus and mucins and glycoproteins to help thicken up the, your tears and there's also a lipid layer so if you have contact lenses and you and you take them off and they put them in your solution whatever solution you use for storing you might notice that there's a little film that floats to the top and this is pro a combination of the mucus and the lipids as well. So remember that lipids, they don't dissolve in aqueous layers very well. But these very interesting secretions called mebomi from me called mebum from these glands called mebomian glands, they actually help to disrupt surface tension of water because water is kind of sticky. It kind of has this cohesion and surface tension. And this mebomian glands, they secrete a lipid-like structure or this oil that helps to disperse and disrupt the surface tension so tears spread easily across your eyes. So this is why it's going to be very hard to make a bottled fluid that's exactly like your tears because synthesizing the mucus and lipid part and making sure that it's preserved, it would be very hard. So I think this is why maybe there were maybe people were complaining or maybe pedantic professors were complaining to this company and this is why you I, like the ball I have right now. It says works like your eyes, so they don't say like they took out the biology part, probably because like somebody was being saying like, hey, you don't have this other parts of your biology of your tears, but showing you that tears are water, but you also have other things to help thicken it and help to disturb disperse it as well. And so you have something called basal tears or constant tears. So these, even if you're not crying, you're always hit. Your eyes are hopefully. I mean, there is, some people produce more tear, basal tears than others. And again, this is if you, your optometrist or ophthalmologist told you you have dry eyes. You might produce a lower amount of basal tears compared to the average. But you have some sort of moisture on your eyes because if you've ever woken up with dry eyes or if you have contacts in dry eyes, you're like, ooh, ow, right? So you want some sort of moisture on your eyes. Then there's psychogenic tears. So when we think about someone tearing up, we usually think of that. So again, some sort of emotional distress. These are emotional tears. And the cool thing is that, I mean, it's not cool if you're under distress, but the thing about tears is that they also, this is why I'm not having you memorize values of how much of tears are water and other substances as well. Sometimes they find things like hormones are increased in the t in tear secretions when you have psychogenic tears due to emotion and other metabolites. So the composition and chemicals you find in tears can change depending on the situation. And there's also reflex tears. So what happens, like say you're wearing contacts or say you're in a dusty area and you get dust or sand in your eyes and you're like, oh my God, and like, uh, I, I mean, 
Have you ever had that situation when people are like, are you okay? And you're kind of like, no, no, I'm just trying to like get this thing out of my eye. So this is ref our reflex tears and, or if even like here, what happens if you cut an onion and then you have all those compounds entering your eyes? It's going to trigger a reflex. You can't control it. They're like, oh, are you crying? And like, yeah, are you, are you okay? And like, yeah, no, no, I'm just cutting onions. And yeah, so those are reflex tears. So it can be chemical. It can be to, due to something in your eye. But what's going to happen is that the whole purpose is to wash whatever is, whether chemical or some sort of dust might moat in your, out of your eyes. So typically the composition of your tears also changes. You have less mucus and you just want to produce a lot of water, kind of like flood your eyes with water. So you typically, your tears that are reflex tears tend to be watery. Even the nose and your eyes tear up. Yeah, that can be both. Lay on my side, the lower eye will leak. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, maybe you can like, that's a, if you, don't with tack back, but that sounds like a good tack back question. I would have to find out more though about that. And hit in your eyes and your eyes tear up. I mean, it could be a combination, like maybe something gets in your eye, like, oh, if it's blood or something, or something, or your eyelash or something brushes into your eye, you might have the reflex tears, but if you get hit in the nose, that's probably a little painful too. So the pain might cause the psychogenic tears as well. Yeah. Okay, so enough about the lacrimal gland. That's pretty easy, but also very important because, again, if you've had dry eyes, oh, you know how painful it can be if it, and yeah, how much it can affect your daily life. All right, back to the pupil. So we did touch upon this very briefly, but let's go more into mechanisms about how the pupil changes. And it's kind of cool. Like, if you look in the mirror and just look at your pupil, chances are you'll probably see your pupil twitching, especially if you're in a room with varying lighting. Now there's two, the pupil and the iris. So within the iris, you have these two muscles and there, one of them is called the dilator pupillae. And dilator sounds like dilate, right? So getting bigger in diameter. So dilator pupillae. So what's going to happen is that this opens up the iris and opens up, um, widens the pupil in response to decreased light intensity. And why? Because if you have less light, you want or less light, ambient light in the room or wherever you are, you want to open up your pupil so you let more light into your eye and retina. So again, think of it this way. Even if you're not scared of the dark, think of a scary dark place as causing all the sympathetic activity. So increased sympathetic stimulation is going to dilate your pupils and bring more light in. So this is why sympathetic activity causes dilation by activating, so you have sympathetic nerve fibers Innervating this dilator pupillae. Now, this is the outer part right here that looks like a barrel, but this inner ring right here is what you call the sphincter pupillae. And this part activates in response to increased light intensity. Or say you go, or if you're being in a movie theater, I mean, I think some, hopefully they stay open and hopefully I, I won't get to all that. But say you're in a back to in a movie theater and you go out, even if you're going out to the lobby, you're like, whoa, and you're like, oh, it's too bright, and you might be like shielding your eyes. Well, this is a natural reflex of your pupils and iris. So what's going to happen is like, when you go from a dark to light place, you're going to have increased light. So you want to reduce the amount of light to, uh, into your brain and your pupil and iris got used to that low amount of light. Now it wants to block and kind of gradually accommodate to that increased amount of light. So you're going to shut the ir iris and the pupil so this is increased parasympathetic simulation and going to, going to cause constriction. So again, even though there's, you could consider like the iris has dual innervation, but it's not the same muscles. They oppose each, they're more like opposing muscles than fibers innervating the same tissue. Now let's to review that. So the sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic activity is going to do the, activate the dilator pupillae. And that's why the fascicles are arranged like the spokes of a wheel. What happens is that as you dilate, these are going to constrict and this is going to pull the pupil wider so you have more light coming into your eye and your retina. In the parasympathetic activity, this is going to constrict the sphincter pupillae. So it's going to constrict just like a purse string or like a drawstring bag. So again, when you constrict the circular muscle, it's going to narrow and close off that muscle as well. 
So again, they're not the same muscles. One ha one dilates and pulls outwards. The other constricts like that a circle. Okay, let's talk about parasympathetic pharmacology. So there's a class of them called anticholinergics, and what they do is block the effects of acetylcholine. So that makes sense. Like cholinergic sounds like choline, anticholinergic but block the effects of acetylcholine. And if you remember from the previous lecture with the synapse of the preganglionic and postganglionic synapse, you have acetylcholine at that part of the parasympathetic nervous system. But you also have acetylcholine being secreted by postganglionic cells as well. So anticholinergics are able to block the parasympathetic nervous or block parasympathetic activity at two different synapses two different types of synapses. So it blocks the parasympathetic nervous system. Go back to that pan am mnemonic. That, the A stands for acetylcholine, right? Now you also have anti-muscarinics, but instead of blocking acetylcholine in general, what this does is target those target tissues that are, are innervated by postganglionic neurons. So there's a class of drugs called muscarinic receptor antagonists. And an example of this is atropine. Now, atropine comes from this plant, it's actually a nat natural product. So I know like there are some alternative medicines that say like you can use plants for everything, but there's also like some extremists like, yeah, there's no such thing as like that. Well, plants actually do have a lot of chemical properties that can cause pharmacological effects. And this is an example of one of those natural products that can be cooked. They just make it very pure and then they use it in this purified form. So this is nightshade or the atropa belladonna. So poisonous by itself, but if you go, if you take pharmacology, you'll probably learn this phrase from Paracelsus, the father of toxicology, that the dose makes the poison. So if you eat nightshade, yeah, you're probably going. You should call the poison control center immediately. And uh, but if you have atropine given in a control, this so this one chemical from the nightshade, but given in controlled doses can be used for therapeutic uses. So what can you use it for? Well, maybe I want to use it, say we have um, cholin too much cholinergic activity, too much acetylcholine, or say we want to increase heart rate, because again, parasympathetic is going to decrease heart rate, but say we want to increase heart rate. So we might add atropine in certain situations, or say we're doing gastrointestinal surgery, so something on the stomach, and we want to reduce the amount of gastrointestinal motility, or say we have too much saliva. Remember, saliva is also secreted in response to parasympathetic activity. So maybe if we give atropine, we might add, or some sort of anti-muscarinic, this can help to dry up the mouth. But the thing is that the side effects, well, you might get a dry mouth if you use atropine, but you're not operating on salivary glands and pupil dilation. Like, wait, how does that work? So if you have a, something that's anti-muscarinic, it's going to block parasympathetic activity. Remember that with the pupils, that with parasympathetic, that's going to constrict. But if you're blocking the parasympathetic, it's going to do the opposite. So you're going to have a lack of constriction, and this is why when you have an anti-muscarinic, it causes pupil dilation, because again, it's anti-muscarinic. And I talked to my optometrist, and he said, yeah, atropine is like super cut, if you've gone to like an uh, optometrist and got your eyes dilated, people's dilated, they put that chemical in there and then it's like you have to put shades on when you go outside because there's way too much light. And he's like, yeah, we don't use atropine. That's going to keep you dilated for like hours. So what they use is this tropicamide, but this is like a less long acting, it still is an anti-muscarinic. So yeah, atropine is very great, but super powerful. You don't want to use that for routine eye exams and drowsiness as well. And why is that? Well, the drowsiness is commonly used, found in a common side effect of anticholinergic. But where else do you find acetylcholine? Well, yeah, you find it in the parasympathetic nervous system, but to go all the way back to unit two and the neuromuscular junction. What's that neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction? Acetylcholine, right? So if you're blocking acetylcholine, this can also affect neurotransmission of acetylcholine up here, but also in your muscles as well. So this is why typically when you have uh, anticholinergic, the common side effect is the uh, lack of coordination. You're affecting the brain, you're affecting neurotransmission to skeletal muscles, 
So if you get an anticholinergic or if you prescribe one, this is why on the bottle it says do not drive because you need your brain, you need your skeletal muscles, you need your control to do something like driving, right? Or don't operate heavy machinery because again, if you're inhibiting all of that, that causes a potentially dangerous situation. Okay, so now we're looking at the cross section. So what we're looking at is now like a top down view. So say you take your eye and you're doing a horizontal transverse cut right here and you're looking at, or maybe from bottom up if it's the left eye. But what we're looking at is a top down, we're looking at a horizontal view of the eye. Now this view is kind of useful because it shows you the two different cavities. The anterior chamber is over here. So you can consider it before the lens and after the lens we have the posterior cavity. Or, so the anterior cavity is over here and the posterior cavity is down here. Now the thing about the different cavities is that they contain different types of fluids and in the anterior we have something called aqueous humor. So it's this watery fluid that helps to, and what we see is this circulation of this fluid. So this, this is where it's produced and this is where it's kind of collected over here. Now the posterior cavity actually contains this very thick jelly-like and if you went to, if you were at the dissection labs or not, at, uh, was it last week? Yeah, if you did the dissection labs, you probably noticed like when you cut open the eye, there was this like jelly-like subject or substance, right? So that's vitreous humor, sometimes called vitreous body. I use them interchangeably, FYI, but yeah, so then basically anterior cavity, aqueous humor is thinner and more watery. Whereas in the posterior cavity, you have this very thick vitreous body or vitreous humor. Now, it's mostly water and it has electrolytes and metabolites and things that dissolve in water. But actually it's very thick. Why is it so thick? Well, it has a lot of protein fibers and collagen. And it also has polysaccharides. And if you've made a jelly, you know that you add sugar to help th and pectin to help thicken a jelly. So it has these proteins and these carbohydrates to help to thicken up this water-based substance. And this is why the vitreous body is very thick compared to the aqueous humor in the front of the eye. So the big function of that, one of the major functions is that it maintains the shape of the eye. Because this is a common misconception is that you're, and again, if you did this dissection, you know that the eye isn't completely hollow. This vitreous humor occupies that inside of the eye. So even though it looks hollow, you actually have this clear vitreous humor. And one thing it does is help to keep the retina attached to the walls of your eye. So the retina is kind of like a screen or projector screen or like a, like a movie theater screen. And, or what happens if you have like a, like a projection film or screen and it gets wrinkled? Well, the image ends up all distorted or say it's not even attached, it's just falling down. Well, you don't have a nice projection of whatever movie or TV show you're watching on that projector, right? So this is why it's very important for the retina to hold its shape. So it also helps keep it attached because if this loses density or if you get air or you have something that reduces the water content, that's going to reduce the pressure of this eye, the vitreous humor. But the thing is that you can also have too much pressure. And I always said, I always want to cover glaucoma, but we don't have time for it to cover it. But yeah, the vitreous humor, very important in holding the shape of the retina, but you don't want too little or too much pressure inside your eye. And if you were here, so again, the cornea is clear. The lens should, is mostly clear throughout your life until, unless you age. But what about this? If you've had this, you probably, I mean, I, I have these too, but if you were, I tried to simulate this here, but you know, these floaters, you might have, uh, I mean, hopefully you don't have these, but yeah, I, I know I have a few floaters, but what are causing these floaters when we have this in our vision? So why do they bounce around and move around? Well, here is why the retina is very important. Again, it's like that projection screen, right? So where is the light coming into your eye? It's coming from the anterior part and it's shining through the cornea and the lens. And what happens if you have something like a protein fiber or some sort of debris here? Well, that debris, just like how when you hold something up to a light and then look what the, how the light is projected, if you have something blocking the light, it's going to cast a shadow. So those floaters you see, those are like the shadows and halos we have from things floating around in our field of vision and yeah, from all the light, uh, casting shadows from the light entering in and whatever protein and other debris floating around in our eyes and bouncing around. So this is why if people have really bad floaters or like my dad once got 
like eye surgery and he got blood vessels cauterized with lasers and then I think they cauterized too much there was too much pressure and it basically spilled all these blood cells into his field of vision so for the next few weeks his vision looked like a snow globe whenever he moved his his whenever he had a lot of activity so he will have to actually limit his head movement because it would shake up all that and he would pretty much have just like snowstorm in an eye. But yeah, floaters, yeah, due to those shadows. Now, there are multiple layers to the eye, and we've talked about the cornea and sclera earlier, but now there's also something called the choroid. So the choroid is located between the retina and the sclera. So the retina is the innermost layer of the eye, the sclera is the outermost, but the choroid is right in the middle. So this is the, what you see is all these blood vessels. So the blood vessel, the vascular area, the choroid is the major vascular area of the eye with all these ar small arteries, veins, and capillaries. Okay, so interesting thing is that this choroid also extends to form something called the ciliary body. So the ciliary body is actually, uh, it projects out here and it has all these things that kind of looks like a spider webs, right? So these are actually all these filaments that help to attach to something called the lens. So this is a suspensory ligament and they hold this lens in place. This is another view of the ciliary muscle and body and the lens and ligaments. So notice that the ligaments are all arranged like spokes of a wheel with the lens in the middle. So the ciliary muscle, it can either relax or constrict. Now this is where it's a little tough, and if you don't get it the first time, don't worry, because I had to kind of, it's kind of counterintuitive at first, because you may think like constrict, therefore it's going to tighten. But in this case, this is where the ligaments come in, in handy. So with the ciliary muscle, when it constricts, what is it going to do? Well, when it constricts, it's going to actually cause more slack in this area right here. So when it has more slack, this makes it less loose or makes it looser. Therefore, the lens is actually going to be less stretched out. If the cili ciliary muscle relaxes, it's going to increase in diameter. It's going to stretch these ligaments and the lens, and it's going to cause the lens to flatten and stretch out. So another way you can think about it is like if you play the percussion or play drums. What happens when you like draw uh, the skin of the drum or draw increase the tension? It stretches things out, right? But if it gets looser, then it starts to, if you like get whatever material is covering the drum or bongo or whatever you're using, and then relax it, then it's going to gather more toward the middle, right? So ciliary muscle is going to change the stretch or relax these ligaments, and this connects it to this lens over here. So the lens is hard, and if you did the dissection lab, you realize like, ooh, it's really hard to cut through this, and hopefully, I didn't hear about any incidents, but yeah, it, you can cut through it, but it's very hard, and it actually has all these crystalline proteins. So the lens is a convex tissue, so that means it bulges out, and the cool thing about this convex tissue is that it bends light. Like, I remember like maybe a few years ago, I saw this... I think it was something ridiculous, like $100 for just a clear plastic ball, but acrylic ball. But what's happening here is that you can see it's taking the surrounding and kind of flipping it upside down and containing the entire landscape inside and projecting it inside that ball, right? So this is due to this convex shape. It's a spherical shape. So once something bulges out like that, it's going to focus all this diffused light into one point. So the curvature of this lens sharpens its focus. So what are you doing? Taking a broad area and concentrating it. So this is why I'm showing this example here. It's a great example of like how you're able to do that. Now, this is also why does this happen? It's due to a phenomenon called light refraction. So what is refraction? This is my non-physics definition, okay? So this is one whole... If you push draw into a drink, you probably see even refraction. The, it's just one straw and pull it out it's intact but if you look at it from the side it looks like it's broken and why is that well the thing is that the light is passing is it over here it's passing through glass and air over here but here it's passing through glass water and glass there's no air so air refracts differently than water and how about this guy over here I love this example he's not decapitated otherwise this pool would be all red over here but 
It's showing you that light bends differently and it changes the direction whether it's passing through a different substance or another. So the thing about when your light is passing through the air, yeah, it's passing through the air. But as it's entering your eye, it's going to pass through your cornea, it's going to pass through aqueous humor, it's going to pass through your lens, it's going to pass through the vitreous humor. So you're going to have this refraction. Now the lens is convex, so again this convex is, compared to something that's completely flat, it means it's going to bulge out like this. Sorry, this is convex, this is flat over here. So what convex lenses do is that they focus and concentrate light, just like that ball I showed earlier. You can also have concave, and notice that compared to convex, which bulges outwards, concave bulges inwards toward the center of this object. So what's good, instead of concentrating light in the, like the convex example, it's going to spread out light. So this refers, so accommodation refers to a phenomenon where the lens changes shape to focus on you know, near or far objects. Sometimes you want to take in more from a wider area, or you want to take in less light from a closer object as well. So it, uh, there's a condition called presbyopia, and this is a natural phenomenon. So if you have a loss of ability to accommodate and change the shape of your lens, then you might have a hard time focusing on things. Hopefully, especially if you're like in your 20s or just, or for, yeah, if you're, if you're just a typical ecology student, you don't have this presbyopia. But if you notice that, like especially for your relatives who are nearing their 40s or 50s, they might end up doing this. And I remember like one of my friends, he still he still refuses to get free reading glasses, but yeah, he's in his 50s. And whenever we went to dinner or something, or if we went to like happy hour, he would always be like that. He would always do that. I'm like, you're embarrassing me. It's like, no, no, no. But yeah, it's like, dude, I was just like, dude, just get reading glasses in. But he's like so vain and he's like, yeah, he doesn't want to do that. But this is why when your eye is unable to focus, this is why he was doing that. He was trying to do manual focus by adjusting the distance of the object because his eyes could and lens could no longer accommodate. So this is what it is. And the thing is that our lens naturally stiffens with age. So when we're young, it's flexible, it's clear, but our lens starts to change in terms of its properties as we age. So here we have an object and we're trying to do a focus right here. So right now it's kind of blurry. But if we're able to round it out, what we can do around or flatten it, we can adjust the focus so it projects clearer on our retina. But if we have a lot lack of stiffness or we have a lack of the ability to accommodate and change the shape of our lens, then that's going to cause fuzzy images. So if our lens can't change shape, if you're like my friend, you have to adjust the object. But if you can't even adjust the, your distance to the object, then you need reading glasses. And another thing that can happen to your lens is not just stiffness, but also discoloration. So what we have with cataracts is that our lens starts to become less translucent and clear and start to, start to get more opaque, hazier, and discolored. So with really severe cataracts, what we have is that the lens starts to get yellower and starts to get more opaque and fuzzy and hazy. So someone who has very severe cataracts might have trouble seeing things because well, they can't see color in great resolution right now, and they have a very hazy appearance of the world. So again, cataracts is another consequence, our lens ages. Thankfully, there is cataract surgery and lens surgery, so hopefully they have some, and it's really cool, there's actually a capsule of the lens, and they actually use this ultrasound probe, so these high frequency waves to kind of break apart the crystalline lens, and they insert an uh, artificial lens. And, and it's pretty, I know it's like looks painful, but for people who have severe cataracts, this really improves their quality of life. And nearsightedness and farsightedness. So remember that convex shape? Well, the thing is that with, oh, let's rewind a bit. So emetropia refers to normal, accurate vision. So 2020 vision, no defects, no focus it, changes in accommodation. If you have myopia, or commonly called nearsightedness, you have defective vision of distant objects. Like, I have that. So if I don't have contact lenses or glasses, that means I can read things. But if I'm trying to like look at tra read traffic signs without glasses or visual aids, I can't read it. It's all a blur. But if you have hyperopia, like, say, you might be able to play things like distant sports like archery or golf. 
but reading things up close, you might be like, oh, I need glasses for that because you're able to focus on far things but not near objects. And But instead of a lens problem, what happens with emetropia, myopia, and hyperopia is that emetropia, this is what normal vision should look like. So your lens, your overall shape of your eye and your lens should be able to focus things to a sharp focus on your retina. Now with myopia, Notice that the eye is a little more squished and elongated anterior-posterior. So what's that going to do is that, and, or in the hyperopia, notice that the distance is a little shorter, so it's kind of squished a little more and narrower and skinnier anterior to posterior. So with myopia, that's go, what's, what's that going to do to light refraction? Well, you have refraction through the cornea and the lens, but with myopia, the focus is a little more is anterior, so it's not right on the retina. So since the focus is over here, what happens is that this light continues its path and then it's going when it actually hits the retina, it's not going to be as focused. Whereas in hyperopia, what happens is that you run out of room. So you don't actually have that focus in front. The focus would be back here, but you already had hit your retina. So this is why in myopia and hyperopia, you have a lack of focus and that fuzzy, hazy vision. In the back of our retina, speaking of our retina, you also have this part called the macula, sometimes called macula lutea. All right, so back to the retina. So with the retina, we have the macula lutea, and we also have something called the optic disc, and this is our blind spot in our vision. And if you have the textbook, and I think in both all textbooks have this bl optic blind spot test, but the interesting thing is that your retina isn't completely in, it's not uh, all the way, or it's not, it's not a complete layer. There is a little spot. And why, why do you have that optic disc in the spot? Well, basically you have all of these nerve fibers and these cells running this way. So where they all kind of gather together to form a bunch of like, yeah, all these optic nerves and all these extensions of these axons enter pass or go past the eyeball and enter the optic nerve. This is the blind spot. So there's no retina here because why? This is all occupied by nerves. The nerves need some way to exit the eye. If you want to, I mean, cool thing is that some organisms, like I think octopuses or octopi, they don't have blind spots because they have a different arrangement of these nerves. But we have a blind spot. And that's what we see here. So not only we have nerves, but we also have all these blood vessels as well. So nerves and blood vessels need a way to enter and exit the eye. So this is why you see all the vasculature and all the nerves entering the eye over there. Now this macula over here is what we call, so macula is important because it kind of contains a very important structure called the fovea, but there's also a condition called macular degeneration. And it's pretty scary because this is the center of the focus of our eye. So if you have the cells and retina start to degrade and under, and all this, the cells of your retina start to be, are unhealthy and they're not intact, then you can end up with this. So the macula is uh, very important because this is our focus of our eye. This is the highest detail area. So these people who have macular degeneration, they have vision, but imagine trying to read something where you can't center your eyes on it and you kind of have to like move your eyes around so you can kind of see things. So people who have this, they have a visual impairment. Now in the middle of the macula, you have something called the central fovea, or sometimes called fovea. So the fovea is a little pit, it's actually a little indentation, and you can see that right here. And the cool thing is that it contains all these things called cones, and let's talk about rods and cones. So it's a central fovea is a tiny indentation in macula lutea, it only contains cones, and this has the highest visual resolution. <coughs> thing about your retina is that it actually has like many different parts of I mean it has it, even though it has visual cells everywhere <laughs> the, the the central fovea is like the 4k of your vision like again it, things in your peripheral vision you can see them but they're not as clear as things you see with your central fovea or when you're reading or looking at this presentation you have in the center that's where you have higher resolution but to your peripheral vision this is why you don't have as much resolution so the cool thing is that with this is why when you're reading, if you look at someone reading, this is why you see their eyes kind of darting like that uh, all around and bouncing around, is that they're trying to focus on the details and these little small movements. 
Now, this is, I think, a cool example you can do this at home is that there are 12 dots in this image and look at the slides. And the, your brain won't let you see them all at once. Well, it's not so much your brain, but the thing is that with these small dots that are very de detailed, when you're so focusing on one dot, you're kind of focusing your central fovea on it. But everything else around it, the further it is from that central fovea, it's going to be kind of hazier and less resolution than the part that your eyes are focusing on that. So yeah, it involves your brain perceiving that, but being able to focus things. This is why you're not able to see all 12 at once, unless you can take a very big step back. But if you're looking at it like right up close, this is why you can't see all of them at once. And then we have the retina, and then with cones and rods. So yeah, this is why your central phobia, and that's why macular degeneration is a pretty, I mean, it's pretty, it really affects, severely affects someone's quality of life. Yeah. So here we have multiple things, but there's many types of cells, and I think there's also a homework problem on this, but the ones I definitely want you to focus on are cones and rods. So there are many things, and yeah, it's kind of cool. You have melanin in the, in the epithelium of your retina as well, and it helps to kind of get um, absorbed. So if you think is that you have light entering your eye, but you want it bouncing around all of the inside your eyes. So it's kind of like a black background that helps to absorb light. But you also have these cells, very important cells called rods and cones. So rods are basically kind of like detecting your sense of light and dark. And then cones over here, these are important for color vision. So cones and rods, it's only showing one cone, but there's actually multiple types of cones. But what we have with rods now, this is a little molecular stuff, but what I want to show you here is that this is a protein called opsin, and if you are taking like a molecular biology class, you think when you have this and cisretinol, this co compound, chemical compound right here, rhodopsin is what we call a G-protein coupled receptor. But again, that's more for a those of you going to medicine or biology or molecular biology. But what's important here is that retinol is actually derived from vitamin A and carotenoids. So this is why it's very important to, if, when, this is, if you're a nutrition major, this is your moment. This is why it's very important to get carotenoids in your diet. Because if you don't get carotenoids and aren't, you don't, won't be able to make retinol. And if you don't have retinol, you won't be able to make these compounds that you are needed for your eyes and these rods and cones to properly function. So this is why you need that vitamin A. And the cool thing is that, so th there's wavelengths of light and wavelength basically refers to how short these waves are. So, or actually, do I want to go into phys physics of this? But what I'm getting at here is that rods, blue, green cones, they detect different colors of light and colors of light are determined by their wavelength. If you want to know about, more about wavelength, I guess we do cover it when we talk about the hearing and vision and um, yeah, hearing. But why is that important? Because color vision involves light and interpreting. So this is why there's three types of cones. They detect blue, green, and red. And you might be like, wait, it's like when I was in elementary school, I learned like the colors of the rainbow. Well, you make all of them by mixing red, green, a red, yellow, and blue. Well. Color vision and mixing light is different from actual pigment and art. So with mixing light, you have red and blue, but instead of yellow, you have green. So red and blue, they form this bright pinkish purplish color called magenta. And if you, if you know computer science, if you've done graphic arts, you already know this stuff. But instead of yellow light, again, we have green light, we have green receptors, so green and red it makes saw or actually green and blue together they make this light blue this aqua color called cyan and then what about red and green well this is again mixing light is different than mixing paint so when you mix red and green like if you have red and green paint in elementary school you know that it makes brown but when you're mixing red and green light you make yellow and then when you mix all three together, and if you remember all the way back to art class where you mix all the paints together and you made this weird kind of grayish brown color, well, if you mix red, green, and blue, then you get white. So the big thing, and the, again, if you've done graphic arts or anything computer related, this is why you have that color wheel. It's different than the color wheel you learned in art class and painting.
So my big thing is that mixing colors of light is different from mixing colors of paint. But you're able to get the entire spectrum of this, and this is why we have that 4K and all that. But if you actually look at a computer screen or that 4K screen, they're all red, green, and blue little small lights. And just that to, to a small resolution that we're not seeing the individual ones. But by adjusting the levels of red, green, and blue, we can affect the different levels of red, green, and blue cone activity in our eyes, thus giving ourselves color vision. And yeah, so I don't have time to cover color blindness, and yeah, maybe I'll keep color blindness more for an extra credit topic. So yeah, over here, so it's color vision, and we'll cover the rest of the senses, or oh yeah, I'll be recording it, and then the other four special senses will be covered on Monday, and then Wednesday is a review session, all right? And don't forget about our December 17th, that's when the top hat exam becomes available. But if you can't make that one, there's also the Manoa Testing Center. Okay, so thanks for handing it, hanging in there, everyone. Thanks to our moderators. And see you all, well, virtually on Monday, live on Wednesday. Take care and enjoy.